have I not debunked that in this entire podcast? If, you, if you're listening to this, have I not debunked that thought that getting married doesn't bring you ultimate happiness right away? Having a girlfriend doesn't bring you happiness. Relax. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Granger Smith Podcast. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you're coming from, whatever platform you're coming on, coming from. Thank you. I'm grateful for you. However you heard about this podcast, welcome. We put out new episodes every Monday. We talk about your questions. I answer your questions. You could email me, grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. I'll put it in the queue. I ask you just kind of keep it an iPhone length and don't send it multiple times. And then we're going to talk about it as though me and you are sitting around a campfire long form. You ask me something, something that's been on your mind, and I'm going to answer like me and you are friends. That's what this is all about. This is episode 143. Let's dig into it. First question, subject line says, I don't love my wife. It says, hey, Granger, I'd like to remain anonymous. Long time follower of your music, but first time listener of the podcast. It's been helping me tremendously with deep issues I'm dealing with. To dive straight into this after listening to a recent episode of yours, where you said, if you, don't, if you have to think about loving her, then you actually don't. So it made me think and realize that I never did love my wife. I love what she's given me, but I don't love her. My wife and I met right after I'd gotten out of a r- rough relationship when we were 19. We got married less than a month after that, and we barely knew each other. We're now 26, and every day this haunts me. We have a two-year-old daughter, and I honestly have no idea what to do. I know what the right thing to do is. However, I feel like it could be the wrong choice. I have caught my wife sending illicit photos on three separate occasions to three separate people, and I currently suspect she's talking to someone else right now, though I cannot prove it. She's very private about her phone and deletes everything every day. It's a gut feeling I have, and everyone has always said that you need to trust your gut. I have been asking God for a sign on what to do, and have recently surrendered myself to God and asked Him to guide me, and I believe that God brought me to your podcast to ask for guidance from an outside source. There's obviously way more to this and way more to be said, but I don't want this email to be too long. So my short story question is, what should I do? I don't believe I've ever loved my wife and my daughter always comes first in my mind. My wife gets jealous of our daughter and my relationship and accuses me of loving her more, which I do. Also, my wife every day accuses me of either talking to someone else or thinking about leaving her or sometimes wrong. Or, or that that's sometimes wrong when I'm, whenever I'm quiet. I'll stop right here so this email doesn't get too long, but please reply back. Thank you. And I hope to hear from you soon. Anonymous, thank you for emailing, buddy. Uh, you asked for my opinion and you're going to get it and you're not going to like it. And I don't think you're going to follow it because it sounds like you have made your mind up. But I'm going to plea the ca- plea my case to you because you came here on this podcast, and I'm going to plead my case to you and to anyone else that might be listening and going through something similar. I'm also going to plead the case for someone that's 19, like you once were, that's single and lonely and looking for a relationship. And I'm going to say to that 19-year-old looking for a relationship that's, that's very, very lonely, do you want to be in a situation like this? Don't rush it. Wait. Wait it out. You could be here. You could be in this situation. So Anonymous, let's dive in now that I've given you an intro to, that I don't think you're going to like. Where do I start? I'm going to start with God. You mentioned God three times in this email, and you have a capital G, and you say you have surrendered. What we do in a situation like this is we turn to God's Word. So there's three, there's three points of action to heavy dilemma. The three points of action is read the word, pray, and ask for wise counsel. It, it's apparent that you're doing all three if you're reading the word. I know you said you're praying, you've surrendered, you're asking this podcast. I would suggest also asking wise counsel at a church. Your story is not unique. It's not new. It's not going to shock anybody 
because a lot of people are going through this. So no one's going to go, wow, this is the craziest story I've ever heard. Like this is just common. But here's the thing, Anonymous. God's word very clearly says you stay in the marriage and you fight for it because your love at this point is a decision. It is a choice. You don't follow your gut. Don't follow your gut. You said everyone tells you to do that. I'm telling you, maybe I'm the only one saying, don't follow your gut. That's your heart. The Bible says your heart is deceitful. It is wicked. And so is mine. And so we follow our minds. And when you read the word, it says that your marriage is a covenant and that what God has brought together, no man can separate. Now, I understand that there, were, there are things that, that Jesus said like adultery that allows you a loophole. But he said that because man messed up to begin with. So that's not, it's not an excuse that you look for. You have already declared your wife guilty until proven innocent. Not because she's an inherently bad person, but because you're trying to find a way out. You're trying to find a loophole so that that court paper looks a little bit better and you can keep custody of your daughter or 50% custody of your daughter. That's what your brain is doing. You have decided she is guilty. This was a wrong decision. You need out. You have made up your mind in this situation because your heart has been deceitful to you. Your heart has lied to you. When God's word says that this marriage is precious, that this marriage matters, you can't go to God and say, I surrender. Now, what should I do when the word clearly says, clearly, that you need to stay in this marriage? You need to fight for this marriage. What does it say to your daughter if you leave this marriage? In 20 years, she's going to be in a serious relationship thinking about this decision you made. And you, and she's going to think to herself, well, marriage is not that big a deal. It's not permanent because dad left mom. Is that the message you want to send to her? And let me tell you something else. The reason the Bible says this, it's not to handcuff us or to make us have miserable, loveless lives. It's because as our creator that created us in a certain way, he knows where our ultimate joy is going to come from, him. And so he builds us in a way and he gives us the instructions to follow him and to follow his word so that we may have joy and hope and peace and love. Not in our own way. Like you're trying to create your own way. The only way that things are created new is from God. He makes the rivers in the desert. He makes things new. He's the one that can turn your heart back to her. So a total surrender, like you're saying, is God, I I don't love her. I'm hurting. I am lost. I need direction. So I surrender to you because you have my heart in your hands. That's what the Bible says. It's got your heart in, in his hands. He could turn it any which way he wants to. So you say, God, I need, I know that your word says to stay in this marriage, but I don't feel that. So I need, I need you to change my feeling. I need you to change my heart. Make my eyes adore her again. Turn my heart to her again so that I could love her. Maybe you're thinking, well, I never did. Well, at 19, You found her, and something happened so much so that you rushed into a marriage one month later. You must have been really attracted, or something about her really compelled you. And then something else really compelled you enough to consummate that wedding and make a baby. Like it wasn't, that wasn't nothing. It wasn't like there was zero attraction. There was something there. So now you go to God and you just go, God, I know, I know what your word says. And I'm, I'm staying for my wife. I'm staying for my baby. And ultimately, I'm staying for you. But I also want to feel joy and peace and hope. And I, I need you to turn my heart. And then your point of action, your action to your faith is saying, hey, we're going to go on a date. We're going to go on. We're going to do counseling. We're going to work on this. Why do you think she's jealous of you and your daughter? Because you're actually loving your daughter more. She sees that. That's easy. Why do you think she's maybe cheating or sending pictures to somebody? Because she doesn't feel the love from you. You're blaming her for something that you have done. 
it's easy to see from my perspective, from this chair and this table and this podcast, it's easy to see, of course she's talking to somebody else. Of course she's jealous of you and your daughter because you're not giving her anything because you've already made up your mind. You don't want to be here. You have accused her guilty. And that's just not what God's word said. Now you said you feel like God has led you to this podcast to come and give you an outside perspective answer. Now, I'm here to tell you, I think think you're right, and I think God led you to this podcast so that I could lead you back to his word that says, stay with this marriage, fight for it. The easy thing for you to do right now, Anonymous, the easy thing is to go to the courthouse and file some papers and get out. But God says, you do that, you're gonna get into another marriage one day, and there will be zero trust in that next marriage. Because your next wife will go, why did you get out of that marriage? And you'll go, yeah, I just didn't love her. You didn't? But you must have thought you did. Yeah, I thought I did, but I didn't. So do you love me? Yeah, of course I love you. Well, there's zero trust because you cannot prove to her that you stood in front of family and courthouse and friends or whatever you did. You stood up in front and said, sickness and health and death to us part, I will love you forever. That's what you said in your vows and you're gonna say it again and you're a man that can't be trusted with vows a second time. A lot of people are listening going, oh, I'm, I'm remarried and it's great. There's always these like exceptions, but you're asking me what God says, and I'm telling you, I don't think you're going to listen, and I don't think this matters to you. But you did ask me on this podcast, and I'm directing you back that you have to fight for this marriage. You might not love her, But think about the thousands of years before you when people were in arranged marriages, when they never even met till the day they got married and they stayed together the rest of their lives. We don't live in a fairy tale. This is not the movies where it just appears that people are always infatuated with each other for 50 years. Sometimes we can confuse infatuation, like I was talking about that in the, in, in the other podcast, we can confuse that infatuation with true love that takes work, with true love that's more than just a feeling, like a fleeting feeling, knees are weak and you get goosebumps, that's bigger than that, it's better than that. Stay with it, Anonymous. Pray that your heart has changed because you have a daughter, it matters. You have a wife, it matters. When you're old and sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch, it doesn't matter what she looks like. You've made a commitment to her and you will love her. I'm sorry you're going through this, but I do feel like you came to this podcast for a reason. You're asking for God's word. It's clear. It's clear. Read it. Read God's word about marriage. It's clear. What a way to start. Okay, next question. It says, hey, Granger, I'm 32. I'm from Las Vegas. I listen to your podcast all the time while at work. And I always look forward for the next episode to come out. Thank you, buddy. Uh, It says, let me get right to this. So I've been struggling mentally on how much I've lost patience. I have a two-year-old little boy and my old lady has two girls of her own, eight and almost 13. I get frustrated so easily. And my girl tells me that I need to learn more patience and she's 100% right. When I'm trying to get my son down for a nap or bed, he's always just fighting with me. And sometimes it gets so frustrating. It feels like I'm always turning into an angry guy sometimes. And I get a little sappy, snappy or have an attitude sometimes. That's not who I am. I'm usually always happy guy. But sometimes the kids just frustrate with me. I would just love some tricks on how to get better as a man and, and a father. Uh, I'm, I'm not open. I'm not one to open up about my problems, but... Uh, I'm lost inside. My head is crying out for advice. Thanks. God bless. Um, Question comes from Chad, 32, Las Vegas. Dude, thank you for listening to this podcast. Thank you for listening while you're working. I'm glad that it has mattered to you because it matters to you. Now it matters to me. And there's a lot of things I could be doing, uh, filling up my days uh, instead of sitting in front of the microphone, hoping that somebody's listening. So the fact that it matters to you makes it worth it to me. So Chad, thank you, brother. What you're feeling is very normal. Two-year-olds are monsters. They're absolute monsters. So, of course, you're frustrated with a two-year-old. Like, that's not something new. That's not, that's not something weird. They are, they are little monsters. As Jordan Peterson says, they're little rats. 
<laughs> no, they're cute. They, they're, they're so cute. I believe God made two-year-olds so, so cute so you don't kill them. And he made them so small so they don't kill you because they, will, they would kill you. If a two-year-old was bigger than you and they could during one of those tipper tantrums, they would kill you. So, buddy, uh, this is a season you're in, and this is going to fly by. Your your baby boy is going to be three, and then then they're going to be four and five, like in a blink of an eye. So the only, you have to flip your mentality instead of I am so frustrated right now with this child into thinking. This is just a phase. This child, this child is is going through a phase that's going to be just a blink of an eye. It's like a small town map dot. You blink and you miss it. That's what two is. And it's not easy. And it it's harder. I believe it's harder for men sometimes because I think women are are better attuned to a small child than a man. And I believe men, a man is more in tune for a teenager in raising that kind of child. Now, we overlap and we, we're we both good at certain things, but I just think genuine, genuine, generally, a, a woman is better at dealing with a two-year-old than a man. You're coming home from work, you're tired, you're, you're, your patience is low. Keep fighting the good fight, brother. And that's what it is. You're, you're keep struggling righteously right just just hang in there hang in there knowing that this is going to pass and look at that baby and just think man two is going to go by so fast i love this baby boy and he's going to be a man one day most of his life most of this two-year-old's life is going to be an adult talking back to you god willing so this two-year-old stage is gone it's so fast so when you get frustrated and and he's throwing a temper tantrum and he doesn't want to eat or he doesn't want to sleep or doesn't want to take a bath just take a second and take a breath take a breath breathe all the way out and all the way in it's just a child and it's normal you did the same thing to your mom and dad everyone listening did the same thing to their parents it's called the terrible twos for a reason this is not new take a breath this is going to pass it's going to be over in a blink of an eye. Sail your ship. You got it. It's turbulent water. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Take a breath. If you got if you got to take a second and go out in the backyard, just yell, do it. Come back in. Recenter. Okay. I'm not going to let this child run my life, run my patience into the ground. Yes, I'm tired. Yeah, I'm hungry. But I'm not going to let this child who doesn't know any better dictate my total mental state. Recenter. Recenter. You're the dad. Take control of this household. You got this. Question subject line says drinking and driving. Hey, Granger, I want to remain anonymous. I live in Georgia. I'm 35 years old. Ever since I moved out of my parents' house, I started drinking alcohol on Friday and Saturday nights, hanging out with my friends. I was always taught by my Christian parents that it was wrong but I still did it. Well, this past weekend, I thought it was a good idea and it wasn't. And I got a DUI. How do I get past this? And how would I get more focused on serving Jesus? Thanks. Anonymous. I'm sorry, brother. This is, uh, this is tough. This is a, this is the consequence of a mistake that is costly. I know DUIs are expensive, and it's going to take a long time to clear this off your record, um, to to get off probation, to get your driver's license back, whatever that might entail. And it's just really exp- the fine is really really expensive. So you got you got a long you got a long road ahead of you, an uphill climb. Absolutely doable. A lot of people do it. It's going to depend on your mentality. Are you the kind of person that's going to turn back to drinking and get another one? And then you're really in trouble. Then you're going to jail. Maybe get in a car accident and kill somebody and then go into prison for manslaughter. Are you the other side of the coin that goes, no, I'm, I'm, I learned my lesson. I'm going to get better. Now, you sound like that. That's what your email sounds like. You sound like the person that's like, man, I, I learned my lesson. I'm going to get better at this. So Jesus is not the 
you, how do I, how do I say this? I hope I could say this uh, with all due respect to you, but we don't clean ourselves up and go to Jesus. There's not a, there's not a time when we, now every other religion is going to say that. You, you clean up and you get your life together in order and then you go to Jesus and then you're worthy of him when you're finally cleaned up. That's not Christianity. Jesus finds us as we're broken. He came to earth, as he said, he came to save sinners like me and you. So sometimes it takes something like this, something bad, to open our eyes. That's unfortunate. But it's like sometimes when you're, let's go back to the, the two-year-old, right? So we just had, had the email about the two-year-old. Sometimes a two-year-old will, will pull up on the couch and you say, don't do that. Don't do that because the rug is slippery. Don't do that. And they don't listen to you. They kind of mock you and look back and they're not paying attention. And so as parents, one thing we can do is we could just go, okay. I'm going to let you stay there for a second. I'm going to let you see what happens when you're on that slippery rug on that couch. I'm just making up a hypothetical. And then they fall. And then they, they bang up their elbow. And then they cry. And then you pick them up and you say, buddy, I told you. I told you not to do that. You did it. And now you're paying the consequence. You got a, you got a bruised elbow. Now, God is a father, and I believe, I believe so many times he does the same thing to us. It's like, you, wanna, you don't want to listen to the word, then okay, let's see what happens. You're a rebel, let's see what happens to rebels. But whenever you finish being a rebel, whenever you're standing there with your bruised elbow and you're crying, turn back to me. Turn back to me. That's the story. That's the story of Jesus. So you want to get past this and start focusing more and serving him. Now you, now you got a bruised elbow. Now you're ready. You're in a perfect place. Um, this is, that's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Now you're at a place when you're ready. You weren't ready before. Before the bruised elbow, you weren't ready to turn and listen. But he was always there. You didn't have to clean up your life to get close to him. He was always, always there, ready. So what do you do now? dive into the word. Start going to church. Make a priority on Sundays to go to church. Start surrounding yourself with better friends. Better friends that can keep you accountable. They say, hey man, you getting drunk again? You getting behind the wheel again? Don't do that. Don't do that. Those are the friends you need now. Not the friends that go, man, can you be our designated driver? We're going out Friday. Those are the friends you don't need anymore. I believe you've learned your lesson from that and who you are is the company that you keep. So look at the five people that are closest to you. Make, make a big note about those five people because those five people that are surrounding you at all times more than anybody else, that's who you are. You will always assimilate to that group, that five. So it might be time for some new ones. Those are the three things I would tell you to do. I'm sorry that you had to bruise your elbow, but I think it's a good thing. I think you're in a great place. Let's take a break and be right back. Thank y'all for listening to the Granger Smith Podcast. If you want to hear more, we put out a new episode every single Monday morning. If you want to find out ways to get a hold of me, you could email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. If you want a special message from me, this is really cool. Go to cameo.com slash grangersmith. Ask for anything you need, maybe a birthday shout out, a little word of encouragement, happy engagement, whatever it might be. Go to cameo.com slash grangersmith. I'll make you a personal video message. You could also download the Cameo app and search for me, Granger Smith. I'll make you any kind of video and send it to you personalized anytime you want. Go to cameo.com slash Granger Smith or download the Cameo app. Of course, you know this, but if you ever want to sport some Yee Yee apparel or anything related to Yee Yee, go to Yee Yee.com. Let's get back to your questions. All right, next question says, single mom dating standards. Hey, Granger, new listener here. I follow Yee Yee and I've heard of your podcast. Uh, my question is, I'm divorced, a single mother, 
for the last five years of an amazing little boy. His father chooses when he wants to be part of his life. I'm also the sole provider and have been. I'm a God-fearing woman and raising my son to be a God-fearing man. I've healed from all um, of my abusive marriage, and I'm proud of that, all glory to God, but I do badly want a partner and a father figure in my son's life who loves the Lord. I go to church every week. I work children's ministry. I work full-time, and then I'm also a full-time mom. I'm overweight, which I'm trying to work on, but I feel like that's what's stopping my dating life. I have no dating life, and my son is at that age when he's having um, no man to look up to, and that's becoming more and more difficult. He's eight years old. I could show a mother's love all day, but there's something different with boys and their fathers. I'm ready for a marriage and a bigger family. Lord knows it. But I don't want to just settle for just any guy again. What do you suggest? Thank you for always being so encouraging and pointing us back to him, Anonymous fan. So Anonymous, this is interesting. It's for, so for everyone else listening, remember the first question I answered on this podcast in, in, the, in the first section. This is, this is the result of the divorce if you give up on your marriage. This is what happens. This is, this is now a single mom in, in that other case with a daughter who's looking for a man and looking for that father figure for a seven or eight-year-old daughter. Th- this is the end result. So, so we could always see through these questions as we listen to this podcast, we could see all the different stages of life and relationships we could see the ones that if we follow a path that God's given us, or if we follow our own heart and chase after our own desires, we could see the result. It's very easy to see. Okay, so um, Anonymous, thank you for emailing. Thank you for this question. Um, this is a hard thing you're in, and, and, and I do have sympathy for that. And it sounds like you're doing some great things. You sound like a, an amazing woman. My first thought that comes to my mind is is reading through the Psalms. Like read through the Psalms like in the 20s. Psalm 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. And you're going to see so much in those Psalms of David and his heart, which is a, a man after God's own heart. And you can see a lot of things about waiting, waiting. I wait for you. Lord, I'll wait for you. I wait for the Lord. Wait, 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 wait for the Lord. He has a plan. He has a purpose. Trust and surrender to that and wait. Now that is so hard to understand, so difficult to swallow, but that's the truth. Anything less than that, anything less than you waiting is a lack of trust. Now you are a God-fearing woman. According to your words, you go to church every week. You work uh, in children's ministry. But... There is a lack of trust. It's, it's, I'm not accusing you because we all do at some level, all of us. But I just I'm pointing it back to you that that if you're going, what's going on? Will I ever find someone? I don't want to settle. I, I I I don't 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 can't can't won't won't. That's a lack of trust. And that's that's not an easy thing, but it's like this. It's like God on your knees at night, anonymous. God. I am surrendering to you because I know you have a purpose for my life that's already written. You have a plan for me. You have a purpose. You have a path for me that's laid out. Let me surrender to that path. Let me surrender knowing that your purpose is better than mine. I could try all I want to navigate and take the wheel and, and, and try to turn this ship however I want to go, but your path is better. You make things new. You restore marriages. You create rivers in the desert. That's you, the creator of this universe. I surrendered to that. So I'm going to rest in that, and I'm going to wait on it. I'm going to wait for you. Say that and preach it to your heart, even if you don't believe it. Sometimes we have to say things out loud and let our heart catch up to that later. But you know that that's the truth, and you know that that's the word. Wait for the Lord. He has glory planned for you. So wait it out and preach it to your heart. And your heart says, no, I don't want to wait. I want to find somebody now. And I'm overweight and I have problems. And, I, and my son are, is getting older and he needs a father. And, and I don't. And just and then preach it back and say, wait, wait for the Lord. I surrender. I trust his purpose, his plan, his will, not mine. I wait. I wait. I wait. I wait. 
and say that to yourself and then get back on your knees and go, God, I'm waiting for you. I pray that you just bring a man into my life. I'm working, I'm busy. I don't know where to look. And so I can't anymore. And I'm going to give it back to you. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to force this square peg in a round hole. And I'm going to say, God, I trust you that you're going to bring it. But I'm asking for a godly man to come into my life for my son. And if it doesn't come tomorrow, I'll pray it again, but I'm not going to worry. And I'm not going to get angry about it because your purpose is better than mine. So I'm going to wait, wait for you. I'm going to wait for you and then preach it back to your heart again. I'll wait for the Lord. I'll wait for the Lord. His purpose, not mine. His will, not mine. He has a path. He makes rivers in the desert. I will wait for the Lord. If you don't believe that, then you're just not trusting. Do that. (laughs) Do that. Man, next question. Subject line, depressed and single. Here we go. Hey, Granger, my name is Jacob. I'm from West Virginia. I'm 23 years old. Never had a girlfriend, and I really want one. I've been on Tinder, Bumble, and a few other dating websites, and I still can't find one. I'm not really going out. I'm quiet. I'm shy. So I'm not the type to go out to bars and parties to look for a girlfriend. I've been praying to God for what seems like forever to bring me a girlfriend and a future wife, but all my buddies either have a girlfriend or they're getting married, and I just feel left out at this point. I don't even know what to do. Please help. Appreciate it. Jacob from West Virginia, um, you're making a good case. You're making a good case to complete. This, is a, this episode is, is like full circle, Okay. Jacob, you're making a case of a desperate man. You're becoming, you're slowly letting your heart take over and it's making you desperate. And the more desperate you let your wild, wicked heart be, and it convinces your mind, that's how it works. It starts in the gut. Follow your gut, follow your gut. Reject that. The more you let your wild, wicked heart run free and act desperate, the more it convinces your mind that you are desperate and that everyone else has a good life and everyone else has a girlfriend and they're all getting married. And and oh, trust me, everyone that's getting married is going to have a great life. Have I not debunked that in this entire podcast? If you If you're listening to this, Jacob, have I not debunked that thought that getting married doesn't bring you ultimate happiness right away? Having a girlfriend doesn't bring you happiness. Relax. Take a breath like the guy with the two-year-old. Take a breath. This is a season. Wait for the Lord. Get a hobby. Go get, go join a club and do something that you love with other guy friends. Wait. This is a season. You're going to have an entire life to be married. You are 23. It's extremely young. You got a lot of life. I was not married at 23. There are a lot of girls out there. You don't need to be on Tinder and Bumble and dating apps. I understand you're shy. Overcome it. Instead of working on finding a girl on Tinder and Bumble, Instead of worrying and taking all the, think, think how much effort it takes to worry about finding a girl and how you're going to do it. Instead of all that energy going that direction, put the energy on overcoming your shyness in, in small increments, baby steps. Like, I don't like going out where other girls are or parties. Try it. It's not easy for a shy person to go to a party. Float in there and hang on the wall like a fly. Go with some friends, be in a group, be surrounded by a group. Work on that and don't go there with the intention of finding a girlfriend. Not that many people find girlfriends at parties anyway. It comes through other re- other ways. Like that's a rare thing to do any so so that's not like the future wife is at the party. That's like no one's saying that. The future wife is at the bar. Like, the, why, why would you want that anyway? I know that people do that, but is that what you want? Like, that's, that's the girl you want is one that you found at a bar? Learn to be content in the situation you're in now. If you don't figure this out, 
If you don't rest on that contentment in the place you are right now in your life, it's setting you up for failure in a relationship. Let me say it again. If you don't find contentment in the place in your life that you are right now, you are setting yourself up for failure in a future relationship because you will have become desperate. And a desperate way into a relationship is not a good one. That's not a good way to get into a relationship because you're desperately looking for one. It turns off people. It sets off your mood. It causes fights. It causes jealousy and anxiety. That is worse than being where you are now. Listen, I, I saw this Bonanza episode. It's an old Western a long time ago. And it impacted me so much. I was a kid when I saw this and I still think about it. But these cowboys go up this mountain a long way and there's this old man at the top of the mountain in a cabin. The cowboys come in and they say, you live here all alone? The old guy says, yep. One of the cowboys says, must be lonely. The old man looks him dead in the eye and says, it's better to be lonely alone than lonely with somebody else. I never forgot that. That's you. That's, that is your email. It is better to be lonely alone than lonely with somebody else. Can I say it again louder, please, so y'all could hear me? It's better to be lonely alone than lonely with somebody else. If you get desperate, if you stop being content with who you are, you are going to get into a relationship where you are lonely alone, and that's a bad place to be. Wait. Work on contentment. Work on your shyness, small increments. You'll get there. It will happen. I'm getting all worked up today, y'all. Next question, subject line says, I just graduated high school and I'm seeking advice. Hey, Granger, just graduated high school. I have a great girlfriend. I'm currently living at home. I'm hoping to get married in two to three years. I'm 18. I want to move out, but I think it's not the right move because I also want to be saving money for my future. Any advice you could give me would be amazing. By the way, my name is Waylon. Great name, Waylon. Thanks for the email, brother. We are continuing the theme here on today's episode. So here, here's what I'm going to say about this. You are currently living at home. You're hoping to get married in two to three years. And you're 18 and you want to move out but you don't think it's the right move because you want to save money. I don't ever, ever, I don't ever think it's the right thing to do to live at home to save money when you're 18. No, I wouldn't let, I'm, I'm not going to let my kids do it. My parents didn't let me do it. Get out of the house. 18 is a good age. If you look back in history and you look at all the different cultures and tribes of humans, there was always something set up about your age, about 18, where you kicked them out of the nest because that is the best education you could have. Saving money is not a good enough reason to live at home. I know a lot of people are disagreeing right now as they're listening. No way, no way. Save money. No. Get out of the house. Pack your bags today when you hear this podcast and get out and go find a job and learn how to earn money and, and learn how to pay bills on an, on an apartment and utilities. I don't care if you have to stay on someone's couch and pay them for the couch. Pay someone $30 a month to stay on their couch. Whatever. This is not about money. Saving money in your parents' house will be lost in the long run. It is not a good financial plan to save money on rent so that you could build it up so you can get married in three years when you're 21, which is super young to be married. Have I not proven that point already with a 19-year-old who got married and now he's worried it was too soon? These are warning signs. Get out of the house. Get a job. Go to a trade school and work a double job to pay for the trade school. Get a cheap apartment. Live on a friend's couch. Live in a friend's laundry room with towels and a pillow. Get out of the house. It is not a good financial plan to stay and save money from mommy and daddy as they make you grilled cheese sandwiches 
I am not trying to offend you. Please, Waylon, don't take this as, as an offensive statement. I'm saying it because I, I genuinely have a love for you and all the people that email because we have a connection through this podcast and through Yee Nation. And, and, I, and I have zero reason to stand on a pedestal and look down on anybody and to judge anybody. I have zero reason. Like I, I will not do this podcast if it's about me flexing and trying to judge and say I'm better. That's not what this is about. I'm, I am genuinely saying this out of love for you because I, I genuinely feel like this is the best move for you to be your best person, for you to gain. Did you hear me talk to the guy right before this that was shy or the girl that was shy or guy, all of them, <laughs> guy, guys, girls, they're shy. This shyness is cultivated by living at home for too long. What makes you an outgoing person is getting out of the house and renting an apartment or a couch or a laundry room with a towel and learning that responsibility of paying the utilities of, oh, my rents, my electric bill's late. They're going to cut it off. I remember me at that age, electric bill getting get going late and the guy coming down the street and flipping the switch at 7 a.m. while I'm still in bed and the power goes off in the summertime in Texas and the air conditioning stops because I didn't pay the bill on time. Like those are life lessons that I can't learn at mommy and daddy's house while she's making me honey nut Cheerios. This is so valuable. That money that you're saving is not worth it because it's worthless because you don't know how to save it or spend it. You will learn that when the electricity gets cut off in the summer and you don't have a grilled cheese and Honey Nut Cheerios in the cabinet. You go, okay, I need to straighten myself up. I need to go out. I need to ask for a raise. I need to get a second job. I need to go, go, go to trade school or go to college. I need to look for a scholarship. I need to work a third job to figure this out. And then guess what happens? Through all that, through those life circumstances, through that electricity getting cut off, through the empty Honey Nut Cheerios box. Now you're learning how to make money and save it and budget it and spend it in the right ways. Now you're learning. Now you're on a path. It doesn't matter if, how much two or $3,000 you saved at mommy's. Get out. It's going to prove something to this current girlfriend you have too. Tell her this. Say, I want to, it's time for me to be a man. I'm old enough to go to the military. I'm old enough to learn how to be a man. And that starts with me leaving the nest, getting kicked out, and going and starting my life. Do this. Do this, Waylon. Anyone else listening, you're disagreeing. I already know it. If this goes on TikTok, you're going to comment and say you hate me and I'm wrong. Am I, though? Am I? It's interesting. Let's hit one more question. What should I go to next? How about this one? Anxiety and depression. Hey, Granger, lately my life has been throwing shots at me and it doesn't feel like I'm strong enough for it. Every day gets a little harder and I really don't see a good reason to stay around if life always hurts this bad. Every day, I'm so anxious, always worrying. It feels like my brain is attacking me. Let me rephrase that. It says, it feels like my brain is under attack and I'm the one attacking it. I feel like it's always my fault. And I feel this way and blame myself and I can't fix it. I'm at a loss. Any advice is helpful. Thank you. Question comes from Drayton. Drayton, because you asked and because you came to this podcast, I will tell you that Jesus says, come to him. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Bring your cares to him. Lay it at his feet. Surrender to him as the one and only God in the flesh who came to earth 2,000 years ago, was crucified, bore the weight of our sins, supplemented all of our problems, all of our inequity, in, inequi inequi all of our <laughs> things, <laughs> I am so worked up right now from this pod, from this podcast. Lay it all at his feet. Go to him, run to him. And the power the power of God is in the gospel. What I'm telling you right now. This is in Romans 1. You are lost 
you're under attack, you're worrying, you're anxious, and that is normal. That is a normal human thing. I've been there. I've felt it. This is, uh, this is the greatest day of your life if you listen to me. And if you don't listen to me, then you're going to see more of the same. Run to him. Get on your knees and say, Granger said that there's this that, that, that you're out there, Jesus, and that, the, that you have you've taken the weight of all my burden on your shoulders with your blood, through your sacrifice, that you were resurrected three days after you were killed. That's miraculous. That's never happened ever in human history. No human has died and three days later come back to life. That is something only God can do. Why? Why did he do that? Read about it. That's the story of the gospel. You learn that, you go to his feet, and you lay it all down, and you will be restored, renewed. You will replace this anxiety and worrying and anxiousness. You will replace it all for hope. Hope that cannot lead us astray. It cannot be something that lets us down. This is the best news I could ever tell you. Drayton, I could go so much deeper into this and I could analyze your question, but you didn't go into any detail. And so I'm not going to need to go into any detail besides run to Jesus. If you don't hear that message, then uh, you're going to join a lot of people that, uh, that, that don't. But if you do, you're going to join a few that do. And you're going to feel it. And then email me back and say, I feel it. Email me back, Drayton. I love you guys. Sorry I got so worked up on this podcast. <laughs> I'll see you next Monday. Yee yee. Thanks for joining me on the Granger Smith Podcast. I appreciate all of you guys. You could help me out by rating this podcast on iTunes. If you're on YouTube, subscribe to this channel. Hit that little like button and notifications bell so that you never miss any time I upload a video. If you have a question for me that you would like me to answer, email grangersmithpodcast at gmail.com. Yee yee.